Hey, well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Stonehill Church. We're glad that you're here. Come on, let's go ahead and stand up. Let's go ahead and take a second and greet those around us. Welcome to sit down if you want, finish your conversations, but we're happy that you're here this morning. Love seeing you guys 
gather and chat and catch up with each other. But welcome to Stonehill. We're really happy that you guys are here. My name is Laura, and I am the Next Gen Admin. And this is Eric, our Student Ministries Director. And we are just happy to spend our Sunday morning with you. And if you are a first or second time guest, we would love to stay connected with you. We're just happy that you came here and you walked through those doors. If you can fill out that connect card at the bottom of the handout you received, you can take that out to our guest services tent, which is outside today, where you can get a free gift there. You can ask any questions that you have about our church, and you can talk to some of our volunteers as well. Yeah, and on the way in, you should have received uh, these cards. These are invite cards because Easter is two weeks away. It is in March this year, which is still, I don't know, my brain just can't handle it. So March 31st is Easter. And we have five different services over that weekend. So we have two services on Saturday, March 30th, and three services on the 31st. And we want to invite you to not only join us, but to take these cards and go invite your family and friends, especially those that maybe are a little bit more hesitant to step in the doors of a church. We want to invite them to be here. We're going to have a fantastic service. We have an egg hunt after every service, which is just an easy invite for family and friends and uh, kids to be a part of. And so we want you to be a part of it. If you're helping us out with the egg hunt and you took a box of eggs to fill up, we are thankful for you. We need those back by next Sunday at the latest. And you can drop them by our office during the week or you can bring them here on a Sunday morning, but we're looking forward to it. It's gonna be good. Yeah, that's awesome. And this week is really special. Um, our high schoolers and our middle schoolers are gonna be taking in a mission trip experience, a local experience here where they can get out in the community and be able to serve locally. So it's really special. They're, we're going to be at some local schools, some churches. We're serving local pastors as well. And so we're just asking as a church if we can rally around this experience for them and pray over them this week. That'll be a great experience for them. They can open up their hearts for service and serving in our community. And also for those that we are serving, that they'll be able to see us serve them and be able to see us as a light and a gift of Jesus. And so we're just asking for prayers this week over our students and coming up in may we have a men's retreat and a woman's retreat it's on the handout right here toward the bottom or right at the middle of the page um, we want to invite you to be a part of it just prayerfully consider joining us for that the dates and locations are on there and registration is coming soon this is a great way that we can connect with one another we can grow in god's word and just deepen our faith uh, with one another just living life and so just consider going to that we'd love for you to be a part of it yeah, if you want to go ahead and stand up, we'll continue doing our worship together. salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession, I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Hey. I believe in the crucifixion, by his blood I have been set free, I believe Resurrection, hallelujah, his life is death's defeat.
praise to Christ the Son, and all praise to the Holy Spirit, and our God has overcome the King who was in this and evermore will be in Jesus' mighty.
fácil. He is the King of Kings and He is the Lord of Lords. And today we celebrate Him. We remember Him for what He's done. And we want to thank all of you guys for being here today. My name is Doug Conley. If you're a guest with us, man, I'm just so glad to have you. I'm the lead pastor. And we're going to, together, we're going to celebrate and remember communion together. Um, so what is communion? What do we, why do we do communion? What, what is it? Um, communion is to remember what Jesus did for us when he died on the cross, when he gave of himself, gave of his body, and we remember the sacrifice that he made for us. Jesus talks about this in Luke 22, verse 19. It says, and he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this, this is the key word, in remembrance of me. So that's what we're doing today. We remember what Jesus did for us when we take communion together. In addition to that, we have sweet fellowship with him as we take it. And then also we celebrate the fact that he is coming back again for his believers. So that's why we do it. Who, who should take communion? Well, communion is really for those who put their faith and trust into Jesus, that surrender their life to him. Because if you're not a Christian, like what are you, who are you communing with? And so that's really what's meant for. It's for the believer, for the Christian and then finally, what should we do as we prepare for communion? Uh, we must examine ourselves. We must look to ourselves and see if there's anything that's in the way between us and God. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27. He says, so then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. What does that mean? If you're a believer, you're a Christian, you are you are secure in Christ, but when we sin, when we mess up, and we all do because we're all sinners, we still live in our flesh as Christians, what it does is it kind of puts a barrier between us and God. Our relationship isn't the same if there's a problem. And so this is what he's talking about. When we're taking communion together and we take it in an unworthy manner, that means there's something between us and God. There's some unconfessed sin. He says, we'll be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord, and everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. What Paul is saying is this, that when we come before the Lord and we take communion together, we eat the bread and we drink the, the wine or the juice, that we really are remembering what Christ did for us. And it's a, it's a serious moment where we are thankful. But it's also a serious moment in which we examine our hearts. If you are a Christian an opportunity for us to kind of look and say, God, is there something in my life that I just need to confess to you, to ask you to forgive me of, and, and not, again, not to make me a Christian, because I already am a Christian, but so our, our relationship is good standing. And so that's what we want to do just for a moment before we take communion together, is give an opportunity to examine ourselves. And so if you are a Christian here today, first of all, during this moment of reflection, I would encourage you to remember the sacrifice that for you, that he loved you so much, he gave himself for you. And so remember that, but also, Holy Spirit, is there something in my life that, that is affecting our relationship? Do I need to confess to you? If there is, reveal it to me, and then we confess it to the Lord. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a Christian. We're, first of all, we're glad you're here. It's awesome you're here. And, and I would say this is an opportunity for you to have a relationship with the God of this universe. To realize that you're a sinner, that we're all sinners. We are in need of a Savior, someone to make us right with God. And so that's what we're remembering and what Jesus did when he died on the cross. He took our place. He took our punishment, our sins. And so that's something you want to do today. And you want to commit your life to him. Render yourself to him. You can do that, right? Just take a moment right in your seats. Time of reflection.
Father, as we remember what your son Jesus did for us on the cross, we are grateful and we're thankful. You loved us so much. You died for us, that your body was broken for us, that you shed your blood, just as the Old Testament, Lord, as the animals and the they would sacrifice them. They would take that blood as a temporary covering, looking to the ultimate covering of Jesus Christ. Jesus shed his blood for us. Today we remember that and we thank you for that. If you uh, did not receive one of the elements or the elements as you walked in, if you would like to, right now the usher is going to come and they have, they have these. Just slip up your hand and they would love to bring you one. And as you prepare to, to receive communion today, I would encourage you to start on the bottom and grab the bread and get that ready. And then you can tear the top off and get that ready to go as the ushers are passing out those elements. So as we take the bread this morning, this is what Jesus said in Luke 22, verse 19. He's up in the upper room with the disciples and, and they're... He's pointing to what he's going to do. And he says this, and he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to them, the disciples, saying, this is my body, symbolically given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So as we remember Jesus today, let's take that bread and let's eat it. The following verse in Luke chapter 22, verse 20 says, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So as we remember the shedding of the blood of Jesus, we take the juice today and we remind ourselves of his sacrifice. So thank you, Jesus, for what you have done for us. We remember it and we are grateful. We see that after the disciples... The followers of Jesus, they, they took this communion together. It says they went out and they ended up just singing some songs and hymns. And so that's what we want to do right now is just sing and praise the Lord for what he's done. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Jake, and uh, I moved here with my family two months ago from Oklahoma. And if you're wondering if Oklahoma is anything like Idaho, it is not. It is very, very different. Um, but we have loved it. We've loved being here. We joined the staff. I joined the staff two months ago with the adult ministries team. So I get to do all sorts of fun stuff. I get to be a part of our community groups. I get to be a part of our men's and our women's ministry and our First Impressions team, and it's been a blast. This church, you guys have accepted, and with our family with open arms, you have welcomed us, and we are grateful to be here. But shortly after I got here, uh, Doug asked me, he said, hey, would you like to preach and, uh, one Sunday here coming up? And I was like, well, I, sure, I, I can preach if you want me to, you know, new boss, I'm trying to do, be a team player and everything. And so I said yes. And uh, he said, great, it's going to be on the Trinity. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, okay, Trinity, uh, softball there, first, first sermon here at Stonehill. Um, but I am excited to talk about the Trinity. This is week two of our Trinity series. And the reason I'm excited to talk about the Trinity 
is because what we think about when we think about God is truly the most important thing about ourselves. What we think about when we think about God is the most important thing about ourselves. So we should think about what we think about when it comes to who God is. So what I wanted to do today is answer the question, okay, what does Stonehill say about what we believe about who God is? And so on our website, we have our statement of faith. We have all of our beliefs stated there. And we have what we believe about who God is there on the website. And so uh, I would like to read that for us this morning. This is what Stonehill believes who God is. This is what we would call a closed-handed belief here at Stonehill, meaning it is core, core, core to our identity as a church. We say we believe in one God existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Although each member of the Trinity serves different functions, they each possess equal power and authority. Now, we talked about this last week, this word Trinity. It means tri-unity, three in one. And we don't see the word Trinity in Scripture anywhere, but we do get the concept of the Trinity all throughout Scripture. We actually see it on page one in Genesis chapter one, verse 26. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image, our plural image singular. So we see the Trinity in Genesis one. And then we talked about this last week. If you were here, the great commission where Jesus commissions the disciples out to go and make disciples. We see the Trinity here in Matthew 28, verse 19. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing him in the name, one singular name, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have name, singular, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we have one God, three persons. The reality is this is a really really hard concept for us to understand. And whenever there is a hard concept for us to try to understand, sometimes it's easier for us to understand what it is not in order for us to understand what it is. And so let's talk about what the Trinity isn't this morning. The Trinity is not three different gods. We don't believe that we worship three different gods. That is pluralism or tritheism. We don't, we don't believe that. Uh, we also don't believe that the Trinity is three different modes, one God in three different modes. That is modalism. In other words, we don't think that sometimes God shows up in the mode of the Spirit, and then sometimes he shows up in the mode of the Father and sometimes the Son. We believe that they are all three all the time. We also do not believe that the Trinity is three different parts making up one whole. That is partialism. We don't believe in partialism. Now, many of you are wearing green, and so some of you know that today is St. Patrick's Day. Do not pinch me because I am not wearing green. I've already been pinched like four times today, all right? So, but so don't, don't walk around pinching people if they're not wearing green. But it is St. Patrick's Day, and so St. Patrick was a real person, if you didn't know that. He lived 1,500 years ago, and the reason that's important today is because he used a three-leaf clover to teach the Trinity, and he used to teach that the three parts of the three-leaf clover make up one whole God. And I hate to uh, dog on this guy on his day. You know, this is like the day that we celebrate St. Patrick. But that's not really an accurate depiction of the Trinity. That is partialism. And so we don't believe in partialism. We believe in one God in three persons, the Trinity for those of you that are image-driven people, if you're image learners, uh, this is the shield of the Trinity is what we call this image. And so we see that the Father is not the Son. We see that the Son is not the Holy Spirit. They are different persons. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. But all three are God. All three are God. The reality is, is that this is a incomprehensible doctrine. We are finite beings trying to understand an infinite God. But what we do know about the Trinity is important. We know 
that the Trinity is in constant relationship with one another. And we also know in Genesis 1, what we just read is that we are made in the image of the Trinity. So this means that core to who we are, our identity as humans, is that we are made for relationships. We are made to be in relationship. So here at Stonehill, we say that we are a relational church. It's one of our stepping stones or one of our core values is what we like to say. And so we try to provide as many opportunities for you as possible to be in community. We have community groups and we have men's ministry and women's ministry and we encourage you to find ways to plug in and do life in community, in relationship because you were made in the image of God. You were made in the image of the triune God who is always in relationship. You were made for relationships. Now, last week, John Whitaker came and he spoke to us about God the Father. Next week, Doug is going to talk to us about God the Son. But this week, I am going to talk about God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit. Now, there are many, many things that we could talk about with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit shows up in the Old Testament. We see him from the very beginning hovering over the water before creation. We see him uh, leading the Israelites throughout the desert. We see him show up in the temple in the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, he descends on Jesus after his baptism. He administers gifts. We've been talking about that in Corinthians. He intercedes on our behalf. He prays to the Father on our behalf. He prays for us. He transforms us from the inside out into the image of Jesus. He unifies the church. These are just some of the things that the Holy Spirit does. But what I want to do today is very intentional. I want to look at what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. What does Jesus say about the Holy Spirit? We're in this Trinity series, and so we should ask the question, what does Jesus say about the Holy Spirit? We're also leading up to Easter. Palm Sunday's next weekend. Easter's in two weeks, and so we should be asking, what does Jesus say about the Holy Spirit? The passage we're going to be in today is in John chapter 14. So if you brought your Bibles, uh, go ahead and, and get there. You can go ahead and be making your way to John chapter 14. Now, we call John chapter 14, 15, and 16 the farewell discourses. The reason we call John chapter 14, 15, and 16 the farewell discourses is because these are Jesus' final words to the disciples. So we just got done celebrating communion, and this is right after the disciples ate the Last Supper. And they are all together. And Jesus knows, he knows that within hours he is going to be betrayed and that the next day he is going to be crucified. So you can imagine, if this was your last night on earth and you were with your closest friends and family, you would be choosing your words very, very carefully. And in his last words to the disciples, Jesus chooses to tell us about the advocate, the Holy Spirit. He chooses to tell the disciples about the Holy Spirit. So let's read this passage. This is John chapter 14, and we're going to start in verse 1. I'm not going to read you three chapters of the Bible, but I do encourage you as we lead up to Easter to spend some time in John 14, 15, and 16. I think that you will find it worth your time as you prepare your heart for Easter. John chapter 14, verse 1, Jesus starts it off like this. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. And the reason I, I want to start here and the reason I wanted to read that is because I want you to know how much Jesus cares for the disciples. He cares for the disciples. He wants to instill confidence in the disciples' hearts that everything is going to be okay. I'm about to leave, but everything is going to be okay. Then he goes on and he, he tells the disciples that he is going to prepare a place for them with the Father. He's going to ascend to the Father and prepare a place for them. And that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And that nobody gets to the Father except through him. 
and that he and the Father are one. That he is in the Father and that the Father is in him. A lot of Trinitarian language going on there. But then he says this. He introduces the third person of the Trinity. He says this. He says, if you love me, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate. Jesus being the first advocate, he is going to give you another advocate, the Holy Spirit, to help you and be with you forever. Verse 17, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Let me pray. <clears throat> God, thank you for this word. Jesus, thank you for your words to the disciples, the way that you loved them and the way that you cared for them. And Holy Spirit, I just pray that you help us understand this passage. Help us understand it and help us apply it to our life today. It's in your holy name. Amen. So uh, a few years ago, back in 2019, me and four of some of my closest friends and our wives went to a conference in California. Uh, now we're from Oklahoma, and what we don't have in Oklahoma are oceans or beaches. Now you guys know that, but we decided to go to the beach, and when we get there, we decide to spontaneously rent surfboards. Now None of us know, none of us know how to surf, okay? But we've seen the movies, and it looks pretty simple, right? You just paddle, and you just hop on it, and you just do your thing, right? And so you can see I'm on the far left here, and I look way confident. I look like I am about to dominate these waves. Well, after about 10 minutes of uh, surfing, I realized that it's actually pretty hard to surf, that... Um, I'm not good at it. And so I give up. I give up pretty quickly. And I do this walk of shame. I walk back up with my surfboard in my wetsuit uh, to the surf shop. And I ask if I can trade my surfboard in for a boogie board. No pride. Just trade it in. And so I go with my little boogie board. And I go start playing with all the other kids and their boogie boards. You know, I'm just doing my thing. I'm having a blast. But nobody tells me that there's something called a rip current that will suck you out into the ocean without knowing. And so I'm just playing, I'm having a blast, but all of a sudden I'm like drifting out further and further away from the, the bank. And so my buddy David, he knows about these rip currents, okay? And so he's like standing shallow enough and he starts to wave me in. He's like, hey, Jake, you gotta come in. You're out too deep. And so I try to stand up, but I'm too deep. I can't, I can't reach. And so I get on my boogie board and I start paddling, but I realize that I'm not going anywhere. I'm paddling and paddling, but I'm actually going backwards. And so then within a couple of minutes, a lifeguard pulls up in his truck and he starts yelling at me on his bullhorn. But all I hear, because I'm too far out, is like, won't, 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 you know, he's like yelling at me, but I'm like, I can't hear you. And so, but this time there's an audience, there's a crowd, Okay. They're all watching me. They want to see this guy get sucked out into the ocean in his boogie board. And so I am just so embarrassed already. I'm not worried about dying. I'm worried about being embarrassed. All right. And so this lifeguard, he's here. And it is as if this lifeguard has just been waiting to rescue a grown man on a boogie board. <laughs> he gets his, he gets his uh, huge surfboard off of his truck. And he sprints into the water, shirt off. Hasselhoff style, I mean, he just sprints into the water and he gets to me in like two minutes and he rescues me. I get on his surfboard, we paddle in, crowd cheers. By this time, my friends have completely abandoned me. <laughs> they want nothing to do with me, especially my wife. She's like, I don't know that guy. I don't know who he is. So, but that day I realized that we need an advocate sometimes. <laughs> Even when we don't want one, we need an advocate and we all need an advocate. And Jesus tells us in this passage that he is going to ask the Father, and the Father is going to send an advocate 
The Father is going to send an advocate, but he's not going to send just any advocate. He's going to send a very specific type of advocate. So what I want to do today is I want to look at three characteristics of this advocate. Now, this is not an exhaustive list of all the different characteristics of the advocate by any means, but these are just three that I want to focus in on today. So if you were taking notes, on your notes, the first characteristics of the advocate is that he is a comforting advocate. He is a comforting advocate. Now in a few weeks, uh, in two weeks, we're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. We're going to celebrate the ascension of Jesus, which is amazing. But at Christmas, we celebrate the birth of Jesus, God Emmanuel, God with us. And what Jesus says in this passage, though, is that the Father is going to send another advocate. And what's really important about the word another in the Greek is that there's two options that Jesus could have chosen for the word another. He could have chosen the word heteros, which means another of a different kind, or alos, which means another of the very same kind. And Jesus chooses very specifically to use the Greek word alos, another of the very same kind. So when Jesus says that the Father is going to send an advocate of the very same kind. He is saying that his presence, God's presence on earth with us is not going anywhere after he leaves. That the spirit of God, the presence of God will always be with us. And not only with us, but in us. Verse 17, it says that the Holy Spirit will actually be in us. Paul describes it this way in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? So the disciples, when they heard that the Holy Spirit, the advocate, was not gonna just be with them, but be in them, they realized that the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament used to fill the temples But now, the Holy Spirit's going to fill them and that they are now going to be the temples. Now, they knew about God before they walked with Jesus. But after walking with Jesus for a few years, they know God. I knew about my wife for a few years before we got married. I knew about her. But after being married for eight years, I know her. And what Jesus is saying is that the Holy Spirit is going to make God knowable. That the Holy Spirit is going to make it to where God will always be with you. And not only with you, but in you. And so there is no place that you will go where the Holy Spirit will not be. The reason that this is important for us today is that comfort often comes in the form of presence. Let me say that again. Comfort often comes in the form of presence. When you are going through adversity or whenever you lose someone in your life, it is often the people that come over and bring you meals and just sit with you in your grief and in your loss that bring you comfort. They don't reverse the tragedy, but they sit with you and they bring you comfort. And God says, Jesus says that the Father is sending another advocate to be with you to walk with you, to comfort you. You will never be alone. You will always have God's presence in your life. The second characteristic of the Holy Spirit, the second characteristic of the advocate that we read in this passage, we learn about in this passage, is that he is a correcting advocate. He is a correcting advocate. And you might wonder like, Jake, how can you have a, an advocate that comforts but also corrects. Those seem like two kind of contradictory things. Well, as the father of a four-year-old boy, I can tell you that there are times where I need to comfort my son Lincoln, and there are times where we need to correct him gently and lovingly. And I, uh, I'll admit that I'm probably better at the correcting, and then my wife's a little better at the comforting part of it. But the advocate does both perfectly. 
The advocate does both. He corrects us. Jesus calls him the spirit of truth in verse 17. He is the spirit of truth. And then later, same conversation, but towards the end of the conversation with the disciples, he says this. He says, but when he, the advocate, comes, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you. I love that word guide. He will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. What we learn in this passage is that the Spirit has the same truth as the Father and as the Son. That they are the same God. So when Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, the Spirit is correcting us and guiding us with that truth. Not just any truth, but the truth from God. And how does he do this? How does he guide us into truth? Well, what we know is that he inspired Scripture. But the first way that we learn truth from the Spirit is that he illuminates God's Word. He inspired God's Word, but he illuminates God's Word. This means that when we open God's Word and we study Scripture, we should pray and ask the Holy Spirit, the Advocate, to illuminate the word for us, to help us understand it, just like we did earlier. We pray, Jesus, Holy Spirit, please help me understand these words and help me apply them to my life. The advocate illuminates God's word. He corrects us by illuminating God's word. The second thing he does is he illuminates God's will for our life, not just any will but God's will. He illuminates God's word and he illuminates God's will for our life. What we know from Jesus in John chapter 8 is that there is a deceiver. And when the enemy speaks lies, he speaks his native language, his native tongue, Jesus says. But we, we also know in John chapter 8 is that the truth will set us free. So you have the deceiver who is trying to imprison you with lies. And then you have the advocate correcting you, guiding you, leading you to truth that will set you free. And so we ask the Holy Spirit to lead us, to guide us, to illuminate God's word and to illuminate God's will. And ultimately, the advocate that corrects helps us see Jesus for who he really is, the savior of the world. John chapter 16, the next verse, chapter uh, verse 14, says, He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. So the correcting advocate helps us see Jesus for who he is. He glorifies Jesus. The third characteristic of the advocate that we learn about in this passage is that he is a calling advocate. He is a calling advocate. Now, the word advocate in Greek is parakletos, parakletos. And it's really hard to translate parakletos into English. There are many different words that we could translate it as. And one of those words is helper, Helper, And so what we know about the Holy Spirit, the advocate, is that he helps us. We have this great commission that we just read, this calling from Jesus to go and make disciples. But we also have a great advocate. We have a great helper to go and help us and empower us to be on mission. Shortly after Jesus tells the disciples that they are going to receive this advocate, this helper, he goes and he prays to the Father. And this is pretty amazing. We get a window into Jesus' relationship with the Father. He's praying to the Father for the disciples. And this is how he prays for them. He says, my prayer, this is John chapter 17, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them, set them apart by the truth. We just talked about that. Your word is truth. 
As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. So what we know with this context of this passage and the passages that we have just read is that Jesus calls us into the world to represent him, literally represent him to the world. But we do this through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the power of the advocate that Jesus promises in this passage. Jesus is quoted in Acts 1.8 saying this. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all the Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So we receive the power of the Holy Spirit and then we go and we bear witness to who Jesus is. We have a great commission and we have a great advocate. So what do we do? How do we respond to receiving this advocate? How does it change our lives and what should we do about it? How do we respond? The first thing we do is that we trust the comforting advocate. If you're taking notes, we trust the comforting advocate. We put our trust in a lot of different things to bring us comfort. We just do. We, we try a lot of different things to bring us comfort, and we often avoid pain, and we often avoid uncomfortable things. But it is often in our most uncomfortable moments, our most painful moments, that we feel the presence of the comforter, of the advocate in our lives. And so me and my dad, we, um, we got kind of closer as I, as I got older. We just did. As I became an adult, we just became closer and closer. And we became especially close whenever he became a grandpa. And when we had my uh, first son, Lincoln, uh, this was... Two years ago at Easter, and you can just see that my dad is just beaming with, with pride and joy uh, in this picture. And he actually left a job site early to come to this, which was a big deal for him. And, um, and this was just a sweet moment for us. And it was just so sweet to see this kind of tender and soft side of my dad that I had, I had never seen before whenever he became a grandpa. And I was so looking forward to the future. But then just three months um, after this picture was taken in June, he was taken to the hospital, and within 24 hours, he passed away. And I entered into a season of deep, deep grief, and I was just so sad, and I just missed him so much. And so that Christmas, um, it was Christmas Day, and I'll never forget that day, I just wanted to be with him so bad, and I just missed him so much. So I actually went to the cemetery where he was buried, and I brought a lawn chair with me, and I went to the cemetery just to sit with him and be with him for a little bit. But when I got to the cemetery, it hit me a lot harder than I anticipated, and I just collapsed. And I, I knelt down on his grave, and I just wept, and I wept, and I wept, and I prayed out to God, and in that moment, and in that moment, I felt the comfort of the advocate like I had never felt before in my life. The Holy Spirit just, his presence just engulfed me. And I just felt so comforted. So I want to encourage you, trust the comforting advocate. Trust the comforting advocate. Because in your darkest moments like that one, there is nothing that will bring you comfort like the advocate. And there will be times in your life where you need to be comforted. And you can put your confidence in a lot of different things to bring you comfort, but nothing will bring you comfort like the Holy Spirit. The second thing we do is that we listen to the correcting advocate. Pay attention to what you're listening to. There is a deceiver who is wanting to tell you lies and wanting to derail you. Now I tell you that not to scare you, but to have you pay attention because there's also 
a correcting advocate that is telling you the truth and guiding you to truth, guiding you to freedom. So pay attention to what you're listening to. Listen to the correcting advocate. For some of you, you may have just drifted a little bit. You've been a Christian for a long time. You've just listened to a little bit of a lie, a little bit of a lie, and you need to repent and reset and start listening to the correcting advocate again. For some of you, you may have never listened to the correcting advocate before. This is all new to you, and, and you're like, I don't know who Jesus is, but I'm kind of feeling like the Holy Spirit's talking to me today about who Jesus is. And I would just encourage you to, we'll have a prayer team after the service. Come and talk to the prayer team about who Jesus is and believe the truth that he is the way and the truth and the life. And the third thing, the third thing is have confidence in the calling advocate. Have confidence in the calling advocate. Our confidence shouldn't be in ourselves. <laughs> it should be in the most powerful being in the universe that indwells you, that equips you, that empowers you for the mission that you have been sent on. Now there's kind of two different ways to talk about calling. There is the capital C calling that we all have. We are all called to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are all sent into the world. Jesus prays for that to happen. But then there's this kind of lowercase c calling that is more specific to you and your giftings and your season of life. And so for Courtney and I, that was here in Idaho right now uh, and taking this job at, at Stonehill. But whatever it is, whatever your calling may be, whatever is specific to you, have confidence, not in yourself, not in your own capabilities, but in the advocate that has been promised to you. Today we have a, a nonprofit. We're hosting a nonprofit in the lobby uh, right here outside these doors called Wednesday's Child. And Wednesday's Child helps people take that step of faith with adoption. And so for some of you, maybe that calling is a step toward adoption. But you've been like, I, that's over me. That's, that's way above my head. I can't handle that. I don't have the capability to do that. And the truth is you don't, but you have an advocate that does, that will equip you and empower you for that work. And so I would encourage you to step out in faith. Today, I, I want to leave you with this. I, I would like to, I'd like to leave you with three questions to ask yourself. These three questions are not to intimidate you or to make you feel convicted, but to inspire you and to have you think about how close are you walking with the advocate. The first question is, if the advocate was comforting me, would I feel it? Would I feel it? Have you been spending so much time and energy seeking comfort instead of the comforter? Have you been running from the pain or distracting away the discomfort that you felt? I would just encourage you to ask this question. Think about it. Really pray about this. If the comforter was comforting you, would you feel it? Would you notice it? Would you feel that? The second question I would ask is this. If the advocate was correcting me, would I notice it? The advocate was correcting me. Would I notice it? Are you seeking truth? Are you seeking to be corrected? Are you asking the Holy Spirit to search your heart and to guide you towards the truth? If the advocate was comforting me, would I notice it? Pray about that this week. The third question is this. If the advocate was calling me to do something, if the advocate was calling me to do something, would I hear him? Would I hear him? Are you concerned? Are you worried about missing your calling? Ask that question. 
if the advocate was calling me to do something, would I hear him? Or are you too afraid because you have confidence in yourself instead of the advocate that empowers you? I would just ask that question, ponder it, think about it, pray about it. Ask these questions. Let me close in prayer this morning. Holy Spirit, you are so good. And Father, I just want to say thank you for sending the advocate. Thank you for sending the advocate that comforts us no matter what we are going through, that walks with us, that is always with us and in us, that no matter what we are going through, no matter how low the valley or how painful the pain is, we have a comforter. We have an advocate that comforts us. Thank you, Father, for the advocate that comforts. And Father, thank you for an advocate that cares enough about us to correct us, to convict us whenever we are believing lies from the enemy. Thank you, Holy Spirit. May we listen to your correction and repent. God, may we listen to your correction. And then, God, thank you so much for the calling advocate that calls us and then equips us for that calling, that empowers us for that calling. It's in your name, Jesus. It's for your glory that we have this advocate. And it's in your name that I pray this morning. Amen. The reality is the moment that we say yes to Jesus is the moment that we no longer have to walk through life all by ourselves. We have the advocate with us to be able to help us make those tough decisions, to be able to decide career path and what we do with our finances and what we do with our time. We have the Holy Spirit walking with us to be able to help us go through that. And so maybe you have some tough decisions in your life right now. Would you allow us to come alongside of you and pray for you? We're gonna have a prayer team up here after this next song. But in addition to that, would you just take a quick moment, grab that pen, write down some prayer requests on here and just allow us to pray for you this week as you make those difficult decisions in your life. During this next song, the baskets are going to be passed and it's your chance to be able to put the connect card in there. But then also if you came prepared with your offering, you can drop it in there. If you'd like to give online, you can go to our website or on our app. And once again, this is a decision that you don't have to make alone. We get to seek God's guidance with our finances in our life and then just trust and have faith that he's gonna do amazing things with it. Maybe during this next song, you just need a moment to be able to be before the king of all kings, to be able to request, to be able to ask, to be able to listen. Take that time if you need it. If you want to lift your voice and sing, do that as well. I want to invite everyone to go ahead and stand on up. We're going to sing one more song as the basket's going to be passed. But this is your moment to be before the King. The perfect Son of God in all his innocence. You're walking in the dirt with you and me. He knows what living is, he's acquainted with our grief. A man of sorrow, son of suffering. Oh, blood and tears. How can it be that there's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds, no praise the one who would reach for me. Distant and remote, but you chased us down in merciful pursuit. To the sinner, you were grace, in the broken, you embrace. And in the end, the proof is in your wounds. It's 
for joining us today. We hope you all have an awesome week ahead. Remember, our prayer team is down at the front here waiting to pray for you. Have an awesome week. We'll see you guys next week.